Hello and welcome to another intensivecarehotline.com and intensivecareathome.com live stream. My name is Patrick Hutzel and I'm your host for today. Uh, today's show will be all about answering questions either live on the show or um, questions that we've had via email during the week uh, that I will read out and answer. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat pad or I can also get you either on the phone or here live on the stream. Just, you know, put up your hand, uh, type a comment in your in the section. If you want to either call me live on the show or be a guest here, I can send you a link and then you can answer your question. You don't need to go on camera. You can just, you know, switch the camera off. It's entirely up to you. But so that we can make the most out of this show and answer your questions, it's easiest if you either call me live on the show or be a guest and I'll, I'll invite you with a link here and then you can answer your questions and then I can answer your questions. In any case, before we get on, um, what makes me qualified to answer questions for families in intensive care? I am a critical care nurse by background. I have worked in critical care slash intens intensive care for over 20 years in three different countries uh, where I also worked as a nurse unit manager for over uh, uh, for over five years and I have been consulting and advocating for families in intensive care all around the world for the last 10 years. Uh, I also run intensive care at home where we provide an intensive care substitution service in the community where we employ critical care nurses. We provide a genuine alternative there for long-term intensive care patients in the home as uh, opposed to a long-term stay in intensive care. Now, um, I am not sure with the viewers that are here whether, whether Paul is here because Paul sent me a message with a question, uh, also left me a voice message. I'm not sure whether Paul you are here. If not, I'll start with some other questions. Um, but it would be best, Paul, to talk to you directly because your whilst I've got your email, there's a lot of missing links in terms of uh you know what's exactly happening with your loved one um, in the meantime i'll just start answering some questions that i had during the week oh paul you're here paul do you want to come on to this call do you want me to call you let me know i've got your number i got your voice message do you want me to call you and then we can talk live here or do you want to come on here live on the show i can send you a link just let me know uh, what you would like me to do Just uh, type in the chat pad what you would like me to do. I can call you or send you a link on um, here that you can join me here. In the meantime, while I'm waiting for you, Paul, to give me a sign what you want me to do, I'll just read out my first question, which comes from... Yolanda, who says, my daughter has been in ICU on the ventilator for three weeks. They have inserted a tracheostomy. However, okay, I'll send you a link. Just give me one second, Paul. I will send you a link. I will send that to you in an email just right now. Just bear with me. Uh, Paul. Just give me one second. Paul, I have sent you an email. I've sent you a link with an invite to your email. Just check that out. Uh, Paul, and then, so I've just sent you a link in an email. And then you can join me here. And then we can dive right into your situation. That would be really helpful for you. Uh, I can see when you're here. Now, also what I'll do, Paul, is I'll also text it to you just in case. I will also text the link to you. I've got your number. Uh, just give me one second. Apologies for the delay. For anyone waiting, we'll get to it pretty quickly. 
Paul, I've also texted it to you. So if you want to come on, that would be good. In the meantime, if there's anybody else who has a question, please type it into the chat pad um, and type it into the chat pad. There's Paul. Hi, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Can you hear me? Too? Great. I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yes. That's great. Paula, can you tell, I've got your emails, but it's not quite clear to me, um, you know, what's exactly happening with your family member. Can you share more in detail? Can you hear me, Paul? Yes. Do you want to share more about, I can, I got your email. Uh, yeah. Why, why, is your, why is your loved one in intensive care? It's not quite clear to me why he, is in inten he or she is in intensive care. So he's my brother. He's uh, 73. And uh, he's been in the nursing home for almost a year with uh, dialysis twice in a week. Um, just a few weeks ago, a month and a half ago, he was contracted uh, with the COVID. And, uh, he went into the hospital. They kind of stabilized uh, at the time and sent him back to the nursing home. Uh, but just 10, 12 days ago, he had a, a heart attack. So he went back to the hospital. This time it looked quite severe. So they were trying to operate uh, his heart. They, they, they placed a couple of stents and uh, there was an existing stent that was clogged too. They said he was not taking uh, blood pressure medication properly, most likely. Um, and so the, during the procedure, he, his heart stopped, cardiac arrest, of course. And uh, there was an induced coma at the time, but um, they, it took about eight some minutes uh, for them to revive him back. After, after that, he's been in coma and they had him uh, with the liver uh, there. And then there was some other blood pressure medicine they used uh, along with some sedation. So they removed the sedation on the third day. Um, and they were expecting him to wake up within the next 48 hours or so. So this is on the 13th day going on right now. And uh, he is showing very little sign of waking up. Um, so we had the neurologist come in. Neurologist uh, checked his eyes. And, uh, and every time he would try to communicate through pinching his uh, hands and whatnot, then he was responding. Sometimes he would respond to me too as well. Um, he would open his eyes half cracked open. Sometimes he would, if I ask him, he will try to hold my hand and will not let it go. Uh, you know, that kind of a, things happen a few times already. But most of the time, he is quite unresponsive. Uh, nurses, nurses were trying to wake him up in many ways. Uh, it just wasn't working. So the worst thing that had happened is, um, uh, he his kidney doesn't work right, so they have been giving him dialysis in the last three attempts. Um, the dialysis they were not able to uh, give him the dialysis because the blood pressure was dropping substantially around 50s uh, systolic, of course, and as a result, they uh, I have been in touch with the cardiologist and the nephros. Uh, and and uh, uh, I see Kim Lee there as a doctor, and they are portraying his prognosis looks really bad um, from the very third day that we have been dealing with them. And then there is palliative care. Now she she was ready to unplug from like in the very first day. So I had to literally beg them to um, keep him on the on the tube or breathing tube for another week, we, I just want to see because the neurologist came back and says, said his uh, brain is 
okay, it's not damaged because they had done CT scan, MRI. There are some signs of strokes, but he did have previous strokes too. But um, neurologists thought that he will recover, but he will take a long time. Uh, however, the kidney problem, uh, the heart issue, is a major barrier in, in just uh, the, right after the last successful dialysis, uh, we planned things out for his me and uh, Peg. So he was ready to go on with that. Uh, everything was planned out. They had a rehab plan for 40 days in the hospital. However, this dialysis um, is, uh, has been a, a road blocker right now. And it's to the point they're saying there is nothing more we can do to save him. Um, so that's okay. kind of a desperation yes. here, not sure. Yeah, no, no, that's good. No, no, that's that's good. That gives me context, Paul. Thank you for that. Um, just so you said it's been 13 days since the cardiac arrest. Oh, yeah. 13 um, days. Yeah. And he's been cleared with COVID now. Actually, I'm sorry. No, it's 14, 17 days gone on. Thursday, 17 Thursday. days? Yeah. It's, okay. Uh, Thursday, Thursday is Friday, Saturday, today. So it's probably 14, 15, 16 days gone right now. Today. Okay, a bit more than two weeks. Okay. Yeah. You, your, your brother is 73? Yes, he is. Okay. And, and the thing, did you see, please go ahead. Did you see previously he was fit and healthy? Uh, I wouldn't say he was completely healthy. I just want to tell you that. Um, just before that heart attack that night, before he was talking normal, he still had coughs from the COVID uh, that he was trying to get rid of, but he could communicate uh, normally. He actually, in fact, called the night before. He was having trouble, some of the nurses aid to come help him go to the bathroom. Um, so I had to call the nursing station and then Ask them to go ahead and help him, and they actually promptly go went in there and then helped him to the restroom. So that was normal. We expected. We thought, you know, everything is good. He just needs proper rest to recover. And the very next day, there is this heart attack. The nursing home calls his uh, vomiting profusely every now and then. So they are saying we're sending him to the hospital. Okay. And, uh, okay. And with the dialysis, uh, that's only started in the last few days? No, he's been on the dialysis for almost a, over a year, twice a okay. day. Okay, I see, uh, I see. So dialysis is nothing new. No, it's just the last it's... three uh, last three attempts failed. Right. Uh, is, he, is he diabetic? Oh, yeah. He's been okay. diabetic for many years. Okay. Type 1 or type 2? Do you know? That I don't know. Yeah, actually. that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at some let's look at some solutions and let me ask for let let me ask you a few more questions. So he's been off sedation already for a few days? Yeah, they have very mild sedation uh, about 0.07 uh, MCL or whatnot. They're using off uh, do you know what? Do you know what sedation? I can give you in just a minute. I have it written it down somehow. I just took it down. Probably Presidex? Presidex. That sounds similar. Yes. Yeah. Most likely. Okay. Okay. No no pain medication as far as you're aware? Mod Mod not, not pain, but there was some blood pressure medicine they are giving yeah yeah sure no I, I come to that i got that I, i've written that down he's on levo and he's on midodrin i get that that's right i get that's the blood pressure medication um so when he had the stent was the stent before the cardiac arrest or was the cardiac arrest after the stent um back in june this year he had another issue uh, with his heart that's when they implanted um three stents i think and uh, out of those three stents uh, one was clogged this time and they added a couple more um okay. new ones 
Okay. And um, so in, in June, he would have had a heart attack, which is why he ended up with stents in June. Is that, is that what's happened? In June, he had some issues with the heart too. And when he went into the hospital, they, that's the first thing they did. They only got stent. Um, yeah, most, most likely he would have had a heart attack then, most likely. Yeah. And just, just for me to understand, so he had, the, he had a cardiac arrest this time. And then he had a stent, or he had a stent, and then while they were trying to put in the stent, he had a heart. He had a cardiac arrest during the procedure. So they saw clogged in one of the existing stents, and yep. there are a couple of other arteries that were clogged too. So those are the two ones. I think there was a third one too. They could not operate the third one. Okay. They were successfully uh, implanted those uh, new two stents, um, but in the meantime, he's you know the cardiac arrest uh, kind of deviated the one. Right. So he was basically having the cardiac arrest while they were trying to put in the stents. Is that? Do you know? Th that's exactly what the impression I get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Conclusive. That makes sense. Yeah. And they've done it for. It took them eight minutes to get him back. He had an MRI and a CT scan of his brain and um, and that's clear. They're saying there's no brain damage. Right. Um, yeah, that's good. They, that's they, good. they could just see that he had uh, strokes earlier. Those signs are still there. But that, the strokes were previous strokes. They, yeah. I mean, he had many other strokes in the past. I know that okay. for a fact. And uh, and they suspect they he might have had mild stroke this time as well, but they couldn't tell me conclusively. Right, with the strokes, with the strokes before this episode, but he could walk, he could talk, he could eat, he could drink. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. He was almost normal. His physical therapist were really helping him. Um, but the last time he was in the hospital after COVID, uh, his health can be deteriorated quickly. Right, uh, I see. So he was not able to walk by himself. Now he needed assistance. Okay, I see. Okay, so, and what's the neurologist saying? Yeah, so the neurologist checked and then he said that uh, his brain is good, uh, but he needs long time to recover from uh, uh, to actually get proper communication when command yeah. and, and action, I guess that's the term he was using. Uh, because right now he he can do that very limited basis, extremely limited basis. Yeah, he has Right. You you see your brother on a daily basis? Oh yeah, I go and uh, if I if, last time. When I checked, that was a couple of days ago. I had to come back in North Carolina to visit him, take care of a few things. So I'm going back there tomorrow again. Uh, he's in Michigan, and I'm here in North Carolina. So three days ago, when I was coming back here, I went to see him. And as soon as I said, you know, in my native language, hey, Bawai means big brother. And he turned his face toward me and tried to open his eyes like halfway through. Right. And he would hold my hand. You know? uh, and that gave me hope that, yeah, we, we, we should, we hopefully we'll be able to get him back again. Yep. But the next day, right. his dialysis is really. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, if you ask your brother to hold your hand or to squeeze your hand, is he doing that? Oh yeah, he does Correct. that. Sometimes Correct. though, not necessarily every Not day. all the time. But if you asked him three times, he will do it twice? Um, I didn't actually try that. I, when I call him to squeeze, he will hold on to it and he doesn't let, let go for some time. Okay. Look, at one of, one of the easy check for you to find out whether his brain is working or not is simply asking him, hey, can you squeeze my hand? Can you wiggle your toes? Oh, yeah, you know, he does that's, that. 
that's a okay good 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 so that means his brain seems to be working oh yeah, yeah. okay so then the question is and i'll come to the dialysis but let's just work through it method method methodological methodological okay. um so he's squeezing hands let's just say they took off the presidex which is a sedative he would probably be even more awake right yeah exactly. okay so let's just say they would do that they take off the presidex he would be more awake so then the question is can they take him off the ventilator? Now, I wouldn't know that without knowing ventilator settings, without knowing arterial blood gases, but that's what they should be working towards. They actually okay. attempted that. Um, they, um, in the beginning, beginning means a week ago, we had the uh, ICU doctor uh, was helping me understand this COVID issues. And I asked him to see if he can manually turn off the ventilator, which they did with the respirator therapist, I think, present. So um, I saw how my brother was switching to his uh, own lungs and he started breathing. And he tried breathing for almost two to three minutes, all right. After that, I could see his, his trying, his steady grasp air like nothing else and then he i can see his uh, hands can we can lose so they started the uh, tube back again very quickly yeah look at uh, it would help you know in, in order to answer to help you find out whether they can take him off the ventilator or not i would need to know his ventilator settings i would need to know his arterial blood gases i wouldn't i would need to know a little bit more uh -huh. okay um going going to the dialysis before i talk about tracheostomy and palliative care and whatnot so one way to work around the dialysis issue is to do hemofiltration instead now okay. there, is a, there is a difference between Mm -hmm. Sorry, Paul, there seems to be some background noise. Oh, okay. Uh, um, so, it's okay. So, one way to work around the dialysis issue is to do hemofiltration. Okay, I'll, uh -huh. I'll type that here into the chat pad so you can uh, see what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, that's one way to work around it. Now, the reason, so the reason he most likely dro drops his blood pressure, here's the difference between dialysis and hemofiltration. The difference is that uh, when you do dialysis, you're removing, let's just say, two liters within a few hours. Uh -huh. Okay. So that can be very taxing on the blood pressure. Okay, especially especially for someone who's critically ill if your brother was healthy and he would go to his outpatient dialysis clinic you know he would be stable yeah. but because he's not stable he can't tolerate the dialysis at the moment so the way to work around this is with hemofiltration okay so how does hemofiltration differ from dialysis the hemofiltration is a much more gentle approach Hemofiltration, you know, let's just say the goal is to remove two liters a day, mm -hmm. right, to yeah. maintain the kidney function. And if they're trying to do that within a few hours for dialysis, of course, his blood pressure will drop. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hemofiltration, they might remove two liters over a 24 hour period. It's continuous. So just to. Um, explain this. Uh, so they did have CRRT yep. uh, for some yep. time uh, in the same. first few days, and they even tried. Uh, I think they do that every now and then, uh, like a, whenever they really need to. But it's not continuous with their brain. Is that similar to hemofiltration? It is similar. It is similar. So they they have tried that then, by the sounds of it. Yeah, CRRT they have. Right. 
okay, then that's not working. Okay, that's okay. There's probably still other options to look at. So another option would be his hemoglobin level might be low. Do you know what I mean by that with hemoglobin? Yeah, the red blood cells. The red blood cells, they might be low. So they did give him some uh, blood uh, almost a week ago, a couple of days. Okay. okay. So let's just say, for argument's sake, his hemoglobin is 80. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they start the filtration. Mm -hmm. There's a very high chance that his blood pressure drops to the point where he might not be able to tolerate the hemofiltration right so what they might need to do is they might top him up with some blood, tr blood transfusions right and mm -hmm. see if that works or other options might be he might be dehydrated mm -hmm. if he is dehydrated and they start him on the hemofilter he will drop his blood pressure so you know it's I would need to look at the medical records or talk to them directly to find out what's exactly happening there. But those would be the things that I would be looking for if I was you. Sure. So hemofiltration along with, um, uh, you mentioned about, you said something about another term. I lost it. Hemofiltration, you mentioned CRRT. Yeah. I did say that hemoglobin level might be too low, might be. Mm -hmm. Another option might be that um, uh, his fluid balance, he's dehydrated. Right? Okay. If he's dehydrated, there's also a high chance of his blood pressure dropping. Okay. Right? There's also a high chance of that. So. Those would be the things, you know, if I were to look at medical records, I would be looking at blood results, I would be looking at fluid balance, you know, I would be looking, of course, at urine output, but it sounds like he does not make any urine whatsoever. Is that right? Yeah, he does not. Yeah, yeah. So then coming back, I also want to come back to the heart attack again. Uh -huh. um, for example, if he had a heart attack slash cardiac arrest, that wouldn't help his kidneys. It wouldn't help his blood pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. I would want to know what his ejection fraction is. And again, I'll, I'll type that here into the chat pad. Um, do you know if they've done an ultrasound of the heart? Ah, good question. I don't recall that. I, I do have access to his uh, medical record, by the way. Okay. I can sure. send you some screenshots if you like. You can do that. You can do that. So it would be good to know what his ejection fraction is, which is the contractility of the heart. Right? Ejection factor. Can you see? I've, I've typed it into the chat pad here. Can you see it? Uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat pad. Probably okay. because it's in a different uh, screen. It's gone, I suppose. Right. In, in any case, basically what, what we're looking for here is the pump function or the contractility of the heart. Oh, I see your check. Okay, never mind. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Because if if that is really low, uh -huh. if that is really low, uh, it'll also drop his blood pressure, right? And then they might have to change some of his medication. You did say, you did say, uh, you've spoken to the cardiologist. Yes. What's the cardiologist saying? Uh, quite frankly, everybody, cardiologists and nephrologists, they give me a long lecture of saying, um, get ready for hospice treatment. Uh, he is in a situation, multi-organ failure is the term they use. Um, they said that, uh, you know, when uh, the Levo or one of the medicine he was mentioning, this is like a, a steroid or, or when you shock somebody uh, how the reaction should be and it, it's continuously shocking the heart to work extra hard for to, to pump the blood properly that's kind of an analogy he gave me uh, if you shock somebody uh, like a you know from from the rear 
you surprise somebody, the reaction would be how, uh, how surprising reaction with the shock perhaps, and and that's what the medicine is doing to the heart, but it's doing all the time, and eventually the heart will become very weak if we continue to do that. We have to wean him off of that medicine. Um, and that was, and that's when they pictured the gloomy situation coming, um, that he may not be able to tolerate dialysis any further going forward. You know, he did this time, doesn't mean he will be, in which exactly I can see what had happening right now is um, they, they tried to um, give him dialysis a few times and, and so nephrologist is basically saying you know, there is no more hope. Uh, she, she confirmed that yesterday right after the last tries, we will not try any more dialysis. Oh, they don't want to try any more dialysis? Yeah. That's exactly really? Cool. Yeah. That would, that's almost synonym to a death sentence, really. Yeah. Um, I mean, every, every time I talk to them, I lose hope every single time. And this is going on from the very first day. Uh, okay. Um, I, okay. Let me ask you this. Are you the power of attorney for your brother? Uh, no, we don't have any power of attorney agreement. Uh, it's just his wife and myself. We're the two. Uh, we're going back and forth as far as yeah. making decisions. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay. Does he have an advanced care directive? Do you know what I mean by that? No. Okay, does he have a document where it says if he was ever in a situation like that, that he wants all treatment options to be available to him? You mean full code is what they... Full code, full code like, and full treatment. Yeah, well, they kind of explained to me the consequences of full code at this point. Uh, they may even break his rib uh, if he or to go back to cardiac arrest or any other issues that had happened. So we asked them not to go full code at this point. They're not opting, they're not going for full code at this point? Yeah, we requested them not to go full code if he okay. has any issue with the heart. Okay, so you, you've you opted for that, not them? Yeah. Yeah, they explained to me they may even break his uh, ribs during the process. It, it could make things. And he, quite frankly, he said he might die uh, if we try to do. Yeah, well, he, he might die. He might die. Okay, let's just say, okay, here is another way to look at it. Let's just say they did do cardiac compressions in case he has another cardiac arrest. And let's just say he, they did break his ribs. It might also save his life. Yeah, they are always portraying uh, the fact that what kind of a life will he have even if he sure. survives this? Well, that's right. That's right. And if he, if he doesn't, if they're not doing cardiac compressions, if he has a cardiac arrest, then he definitely won't survive. Then he definitely won't have a life. Yeah. So you you have to weigh up the pros and the cons here. And I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what to do, but I'm, you know, I'm here to put things in perspective for you. You know, it's oh. also, you have to keep, you have to keep in mind, Paul, that if he was to die because they're not going to resuscitate him, right? Yeah. It's so much easier for them to deal with it, right? Uh. At the moment, they're dealing with you. They're dealing with his wife. They're dealing with a very uncertain situation. You are dealing with a very uncertain situation, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, the easy way out for them is to let him die. That's the easy way out. Dealing with the tracheostomy, you know, dealing with saving his life, doing whatever is necessary is much more difficult than letting him die. Yeah, it's so easy for them. You're absolutely right. Um, it's just the fact that uh, they were scaring 
in a sense um, that uh, if if he if they were to go full court, there would be further worse conditions even if he survives. So we thought perhaps it's probably better not to go through the full court. It could be quite. You heavy. see, you see, Paul, the problem. The mm -hmm. problem with not going full code, full code is this. There is, a, there is a massive perception problem. By him not being full code, it basically means for them, oh, we don't have to try hard enough. Ah. That's my experience. I see. That's my experience, right? You know, it's like for them, it's like, oh, yeah, if he's not full code, we won't be trying hard enough. That's my experience. I see. I see. Um, coming back to the hemofiltration. I have another tip there because you keep saying that, you know, he's got, uh, you know, his blood pressure drops. Here's another tip. Okay, let's just say they are removing 100 mils an hour. Uh -huh. Okay, and let's just say that drops his blood pressure. Okay, they should try removing 50 mils an hour. Okay. If that doesn't work and his blood pressure is still low, mm -hmm. they should try removing 25 mils an hour. Okay. Right? So the devil, the devil's in the detail. Right? Mm -hmm. The so reality this... is, the reality mm -hmm. is, Paul, that if they're not doing dialysis or hemofiltration, he will die inevitably. Yeah. Can you can you see? why I'm saying he should be full code. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have to call back and then reverse that immediately. Right. So yeah. so by, by you agreeing to him not being full code, uh, we, we, won't as, we might as well not do dialysis. Same thing, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would... And, and yes, and yes, they are right in saying that, God forbid, if he has another cardiac arrest, yes, they might crack his ribs. I agree with that. But that might also save his life. It might not. No one knows. Right. But, you know, it's like you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yes, absolutely. Um... Right? For them... For them, it's the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance for them is not do CPR, not do dialysis. That's the path of least resistance for them. Yes. Right? Easiest way out. Is, easy way out, right? It's mm -hmm. a very difficult situation, Paul. I'm not suggesting that this is an easy situation. I'm not suggesting that by any means. Right? Right? I, I, you know, I've seen those cases hundreds of times. You know, you, it's very uncertain whether your, your brother will survive. I couldn't tell you from here. But what I can tell you is that by them not trying, he definitely won't survive. Yeah. That's what I can tell you. Well, quite frankly, they, they are almost ready to unplug him uh, every time I'm talking to him right now. Uh, and uh, this is just so desperation, um, and I'm not seeing you know any light at the end of the tunnel. Trying to find, so we even tried to switch him to a different hospital. I spoke to the case manager this afternoon, and uh, she told me what you I will have to do to transfer him to a different uh, hospital. He used to be a patient there previously too. Uh, so, do you have any uh, any suggestion on that regard? As would that make any difference? Yeah, switch? I do have I do have a suggestion here. You can send your brother to another hospital. There's probably nothing stopping you from doing that. Mm -hmm. However, it can be very stressful for you, for your brother's wife you know, for your brother himself going to another hospital. I do believe your low-hanging fruit here is to revoke the DNR. Sure. That's done. Right? I will do it right revoke, revoke that. Mm -hmm. Ask them. 
to keep trying with hemofiltration because if they're not doing either of it, he will die, right? Yeah. And if for whatever reason they're not, you know, nothing changes and he's not improving, then then I believe you, you should look at another hospital. But I, I believe you should look at other steps first. Okay, so hemofilter is somewhat hopeful idea, I suppose. Um, if they can do hemofilter, um, that has a possibility to linger his uh, recovery, of course. And that will give him enough time to hopefully recover his brain too, so he can wake up. Uh, in a sense. What, what he needs is time, Paul. Yeah. He needs time. And by them saying we're not doing CPR, and by them saying we're not doing hemofiltration, that's not giving him time. Right. I mean, we almost, when they said uh, we will not do dialysis, we have done everything we can so far. Um, that was that was so discouraging, and I I really thought. Oh, they are telling me this is it. You know, at that point, I don't know what else to do other than um, try a different facility if they can find a way to do something. Now, the first thing. Sense. So, so here, here is another tip, Paul. Mm -hmm. So let's just say you would s search for another facility. Okay, let's just say you would do that. If he's not for CPR they will say, what's the point? Your first step is to remove the DNR. That's sure. your first step. Yeah. Right? Because even if another facility is your next step, if he's, for, if he's not for CPR, they will say, well, what are we doing here? Yeah. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you see, it all yeah. comes back to that. Yeah. You, you need to make sure as a next step, that he is for full treatment. That is your next step. Sure. Uh, right? Because only then, only then will he have all options available to him. At the moment, you, you've already limited his options by agreeing that he's not for CPR. I see. Um, yeah, uh, this was after the discussion we had yesterday when they said we cannot, we, we will not do any more dialysis. And uh, there's nothing we can do. Well, okay, Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll be very blunt here. By them no longer trying dialysis or hemofiltration, by them no longer wanting to do CPR, that could be perceived as murder. Yeah. Very strong word that I'm using here. Very strong word, but you know, that's denying treatment. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll be on the call right now and then reverse that immediately. And then, only then, once you've made sure that all options are available to him, and if they're still not wanting to do that, that's when you can think about going to another hospital. But you have to keep in mind you are in charge here. They have no right mm -hmm. to stop treatment. They have absolutely no right to do so. Okay. Okay. So don't let them intimidate you. Don't don't let them intimidate you. You are in charge. Yeah. It's not, there is not one state in the U.S., where the families can't direct care. It's not up to them, it's up to you. You just need to you just need to action it. That's all. Sure, sure. Um, but that will do right away, no problem. Um, it's just that every time I discussed any issues, they, it's so negative. I, I leave yeah. with uh, yeah. with the feeling that this is it, you know. Uh, yeah, sure. And that's and that's the feeling they want you to leave you with. That's exactly the feeling they want you to feel. They're very manipulative. I'll tell you a quick story here. Just uh, in June, when he had the first incident with the heart, um, so the palliative care um, nurse, she called me at the time and 
he was telling me to do exact same thing. Put him through the hospice, they will stop dialysis. I was really furious at the time. And uh, can you imagine if I let her do that, he would be dead by then. Uh, yeah. And it's the and same, it's the same, same now. It's the same yeah. now, Paul. Uh, look, look. If you're giving up, you're giving up. There's no return from that. Yeah. Right? I have no predictions for the future here. The only prediction that I do have is if you're giving up, you know the outcome. If you're not giving up, you don't know the outcome. It could be a good outcome, could not be a good outcome. But the reality is that if you don't try, you know the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let me talk to them right away. We'll reverse that. And uh, hemo filter is the next option that we could. It sounds, it sounds to me like they've tried the hemofiltration already. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like they tried the, but but try ask again maybe you know maybe they haven't tried the hemofiltration maybe they have only tried dialysis i give you one tip here mm -hmm. there are some icus they only do dialysis and they don't do hemofiltration now let's just say they they haven't done hemofiltration and they can't do hemofiltration that's when you might need to look at another icu however mm -hmm. in the meantime it still comes back. I would revoke that DNR now. Yep, I will be on the phone right away. Mm. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions, Paul? So yes, uh, let's say hemo is not an option. What's next? Look, if hemofiltration is not an option. I like I said to you, it all depends on how they approach it. Right? Mm -hmm. Again, let me go through that again. So let's just say the goal is to remove two liters a day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they want to achieve that by removing a hundred mils an hour. Hundred mils an hour is two thousand four hundred mils in a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's just say he can't tolerate a hundred removal of a hundred mils an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, because he's dropping his blood pressure. The next step is to start with 50 mils an hour, for example, and see whether he can tolerate that. Right. And then also potentially put him on a fluid restriction. So let's just say at the moment he's getting, you know, 1500 mils in a day. Mm -hmm. Maybe reduce that 2,000 mil to buy him some time. Okay. Fluid intake limited. Okay. So that would be my recommendation there. Okay. Fluid intake and hemoglobin. Sorry, hemofiltration uh, and gradually lower the uh, the filtration, I suppose, from 100 to 50 to 25 if we have to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and like I mentioned earlier, maybe his hemoglobin is too low. Mm -hmm. Maybe he needs a blood transfusion or two. I don't know. I would only know if I either asked them or looked at the medical records, you know. Yeah, I can... Take a look. I, I'll share. I'll send you an email with the with the medical uh, record somewhere. Current state. Maybe not able to take a look at it. Um, yeah. Go from there. All right. Okay. I hope yeah. that helps. I hope. Oh, that this helps. is tremendous. Anything at this point is light to us. I appreciate this, Patrick. You're a good man. Thank it's you. a great pleasure. It's a great yeah. pleasure. All the best for now, Paul. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me continue with some questions that came in during the week. And uh, I will read out the questions that came in during the week. I've got another 10 minutes to go. Anybody else who has some questions, just type them into the chat pad. I can also um, send you a link. And you can come in live on the show, but I only have another 10 minutes left. So 
let's go back to the questions that came in during the week. Uh, the next question that I have is from Yolanda, who says, my daughter has been in ICU on the ventilator for three weeks. They have inserted a tracheostomy. However, they have taken her out the ventilator and giving her oxygen through the tube in her throat. My biggest concern is she's not waking up. It's three weeks in ICU, a long time. Can she go home? Great question, Yolanda. So it's not clear. You haven't mentioned why your daughter is in ICU. You have given me no indication why. Um, however, taking her off the ventilator and giving her oxygen through the tube is a good sign. Okay, that is a very good sign because she has been liberated from the ventilator. So next, is three, three weeks in ICU a long time? Well, the answer to that is that it really depends. Again, you, have, you haven't given me any indication why she's in ICU. Uh, if she's hemodynamically stable, she can go home. Absolutely. She can go home with a tracheostomy, even with a ventilator, with a service intensive care at home. And you can find out more information at intensivecareathome.com. With intensive care at home, we are providing a genuine alternative for a long-term stay in intensive care, predominantly for long-term ventilated adults and children with tracheostomies, but also for patients, adults and children that are not ventilated and have a tracheostomy. So the answer to your question, Yolanda, can your daughter go home with a tracheostomy? Absolutely, yes. That's assuming she's hemodynamically stable, but she must be, otherwise it will be difficult for her to come off the ventilator. Right. Um, but overall, if she's not waking up, so the next questions are, is she being mobilized? Is she getting out of bed? Is she getting stimulated? Is she getting physical therapy? Is she getting, is doing somewhat breathing exercises with her? Is she getting good nursing care? Is she having showers on a daily basis? Imagine she's been lying in bed for the last three weeks. Of course, she's not waking up. But other issues here are other questions are, Yolanda, is she still on sedation? You know, is she on sedatives? Is she on opiates that make her sleepy or that keep her sleepy? Right. That is the question here. So um, I hope that answers your question. Now, with Intensive Care at Home, if you're thinking of that, go to intensivecareathome.com for more information. Now, with Intensive Care at Home, we are currently operating all around Australia. We are operating in all major capital cities and as well as regional and rural areas. Uh, we are an NDIS TAC in Victoria, IKEA in New South Wales, NIISQ approved community service provider. We are also having received uh, funding through the Department of Health as well as public hospitals. So you should contact us there about funding options uh, if that's of interest for you. Okay, I hope that answers your questions there, Yolanda. And I've got time for one more quick question from Gia, who says, my sister was already on a, trial, tri on a trilogy machine and her heart stopped. The paramedics brought her back and she's been in the hospital now for about three and a half weeks. They say that she cannot come back home because she'll have to be on full time life support. And I don't understand why. Yeah, similar to Yolanda's question, uh, she can go home with intensive care at home. There's no reason why she can't, assuming she's hemodynamically stable but there's absolutely nothing stopping her from going home, um, especially if she's been in there for three and a half weeks and she has a tracheostomy, of course. You didn't say that. Um, but, you know, that's what we do at home with intensive care at home. Most of our clients are in full-time life support because, unfortunately, they failed to wean off ventilation and tracheostomy. Okay, so go and check out intensivecareathome.com. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up here for today. I want to thank you all for coming onto the show. I also want to thank you if you're watching this in replay. Um, you can comment below the video what questions you have, you know, uh, what questions and insights you have from this video. Um, and, you know, you can come on to the next show live if you want to and, and have your questions answered. Now, if you have a loved one in intensive care, and you need help, go to intensivecarehotline.com, call us on one of the numbers on the top of our website, or send us an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com with your questions. Also, have a look at our membership for families in intensive care at intensivecaresupport.org. 
there you have access to me and my team 24 hours a day in a membership area and via email and we answer all questions intensive care and intensive care at home related i also offer one-on-one -on -one consulting for families in intensive care i talk to doctors and nurses directly i do so via zoom skype phone whatsapp whichever medium works best for you i talk to you and your families i liaise with you and the doctors the nurses and I make sure that you make informed decisions, get peace of mind, control power and influence, because I ask all the questions that you haven't even considered asking, but must be asked when you have a loved one in intensive care. I also represent you in family meetings with intensive care teams directly. I talk to them directly. If I was you, I would not go into a meeting with intensive care teams without having an advocate by your side that once again knows what to ask, knows what to look for, and knows what to expect. I've been in hundreds of those meetings and I know what the intensive care team says. I know when they say it. I know how they say it. I know their agenda inside out and I'll make sure you get your needs met. We also offer medical record reviews in real time so that you can get a second opinion in real time. We also... Um, Offer medical record reviews after intensive care if you have unanswered questions, if you simply need enclosure or if you are um, suspecting medical negligence. Like I said, if you need intensive care at home, go to intensivecareathome.com. We are currently operating all around Australia. More information at intensivecareathome.com. Now, if you like my videos, subscribe to my YouTube channel for regular updates for families in intensive care. Click the like button, click the notification bell, share the video with, with your friends and families and comment below what you want to see next or what questions and insights you have. I do these YouTube lives every Sunday, 10.30 a.m. Sydney, Melbourne time, which is currently 7.30 p.m. on a Saturday, U.S. Eastern Standard Time, which is 3.30 p.m. Pacific time on a Saturday. Now, I want to thank you again for watching. I look forward to seeing you again here and take care for now. Wishing you and your families all the best.